Are you struggling with messy tests and a disorganized testing suite? Let's see four popular test naming conventions to help you choose the perfect one for your team and transform your tests into a maintainable and well-structured test suite. But first, let's talk about why should you care? Test naming conventions have a positive impact in test readability, maintainability, and team collaboration. Not only that, but proper naming is a good step on the direction of quick feedback and it's extremely helpful to understand why a test is failing. On the other hand, some test naming policies can create a lot of friction. So it's important to consider that even with a test naming policy, you can still do a poor job naming your tests. But now let's dig into the topic of this video and let's see four popular test naming conventions. I have here a small sample with four test naming conventions. It's important to explain that I try to group conventions that are quite similar and by doing that exercise I end up with four main options. Then you can choose your slight variations according to your tastes and to your team preferences. During this exercise I will try to explain the good things of that convention and also the ones that I don't like. By the end, I will share with you some tips so you can choose the perfect convention for your team. And also I will share with you the one that I'm leaning into nowadays. Let's start with option one. Option one is the most common one that I see in c -sharp code. Why? Because even Microsoft recommends this approach. This is the approach that comes from the Art of Unit Testing book and is widely used and let's see how, how you do that. Basically, this convention says that you should have the method name, then you have an underscore, then the state under test, and then after another underscore, you have the expected behavior. So in a simple test like this one, that is the one that we'll be seeing through all those conventions, where I'm basically setting up an account balance to zero, I'm doing a given deposit, and then I'm checking if the amount on that account balance it's equal to the value of the deposit. So in a scenario like this one, that first part will be the method name of the act that we are doing, so the action that we are calling. Then I'm defining the state under test. Basically, I'm saying when the account balance is zero, it's empty. And last but not least, I will write the expected behavior. So it's basically the assertion. The other common variation is swap those two, the state and the expected behavior. So you end up with something like this, expected behavior first, and then the state under test. So we can group those two together. What are the good things on this approach? First is widely used. Convincing someone in your team to use it is quite simple. Usually you will guide them to the Art of Unit Testing book. You will reference the article by Microsoft where they say that this is a common approach. And usually everyone tries to, to follow through this one. On the other hand, I really don't like this approach because this type of test leads you to write tests against methods on classes. What does that mean? It means that my tests don't have a perspective of behavior driven. So my unit is not a behavior, it's a method, it's a class, it's a function. Doing that is leading me into the wrong direction that I want with my tests. The other thing that I really don't like is that if I need to rename the method deposits to something different, I might go to that method, use a quick refactoring by my IDE, and then I will not think about it and my test will keep running because the refactoring will update those ones as well, but the naming of the test will not match the implementation. So now my convention is failing and my test is telling me flies. So this is one of the reasons why I don't like this approach. On our option two, I have those conventions that say that you should have something like when, the state where you are at, and then something like a should or an expect to describe the behavior that should happen. So you may end up with something like when a state under test should expect a behavior, or for example, the other approaches that I grouped together, like when underscore, for example, expect underscore, or should when. Those three are slight variations of the same approach. These approaches are much better than the other one that I show you. Why? Because you don't have the method here. Since you don't have the method, now you are not locked in to the implementation details. So this is a way that is more 
behavior driven and to lead you to better tests. One concern about this approach is the repetition of words like when, then, expect, should. Those things are typically considered kind of an anti-pattern on test naming. Besides that, you may end up with a test that is really hard to read because you have those sections, but then all the text that you need to describe, for example, a when may be too big. And if you are doing Pascal case, it may not be that easy to understand what the test is doing. Either way, I find this one a better approach than the other one. Option three is based on given when then, an approach that is common on behavior driven development. But even being a BDD test naming style, it doesn't mean that you can't do that in your unit tests. By definition, this approach will lead you into a behavior driven style of writing your tests. But one concern with this approach is that once again, you need to a lot of repetition, the given, the when, the then, and in fact, the test may be a bit hard to read on that case. On my personal experience, I also have seen that sometimes you can't find the preconditions so you will express your test without that part, and that can create some confusion. Last but not least, let's take a look into option four. On the option four, I have here slightly variations, like the one that starts with test, and then describes the feature that is being tested, the one that only describes the feature being tested, but in camel case, or exactly the same thing, but in snake case. By the end, you will understand why I have those three here. As an example, if you ever read the test of TDD by example by Kent Beck, you will notice that some of the tests there will have this test prefix. And some people adopt that and bring it into C -sharp tests. But I don't find that test prefix as useful in .NET. In some languages, or some testing frameworks, you may need to have it, but in .NET, you don't. You know that this thing is a test because you already have some attributes that will tell you that, in fact, it's a test. So this one here, for me, it's not real an option. You should consider between those two. And now let's discuss why those options are interesting. On this approach, it's the one that is more of freeform approach, which is, can be a good thing because you will express your tests in plain English, what helps you in the approach that your test should be documentation, right? On the other hand, I find that those two may be a problem if you don't have a lot of experience. While on the other approaches, you have a kind of a template, a guide. This one is really free form. If you don't have already a test space there that will guide you on the correct direction, this one can be a bit tricky. Even then for experienced developers with a lot of training writing tests, you will see a huge benefit on this approach. And why do I have here the one with snake case? When you express things in free form and you want them to be human readable, kind of natural language, this way it's much simpler to read a, a huge sentence. And while Pascal case makes a lot of sense in .NET and you should do it when you are naming your methods, in fact, those methods will not be invoked by, by another developer. They are there just for your testing framework, pick them, run them and give you feedback. And I find this approach quite simple to read when there's the snake case on it. How should you pick the correct naming strategy for your tests? First thing that you should consider is doing that as a team. Individual decisions will not lead to team satisfaction. First thing that you should do is bring everyone together, maybe forward them this video, and then take uh, uh, the decision together. Listen to the team preferences, but also take a look into the project technologies that you use. Don't pick only a decision, for example, based on C Sharp. If you also use JavaScript for front end, take a look onto those and see the better conventions for those. Sometimes they will differ. Other thing that you should think about is readability and maintainability. You should think about those options and see the ones that you find easier to read, but also the ones that don't bring you an extra cost when you are doing refactorings, for example. And last but not least, Try to define how hard is your test naming policy. Having strict rules sometimes don't work. Sometimes you will find some edge case where having that consistency on the test naming will not work. So try to work on those. Try to keep this document as a live document and take decisions together when you find something that doesn't match the pattern. On the other end, I would prefer to give some flexibility. Let the team know that, okay, these things may happen. And when they happen, feel free to take the best decision and let's report back and think about it once again. 
before we go, let me share with you, as I promised, what I am doing nowadays. While I start using that option one, I remember that first approach that I used to do was this one, method name, state under test, expected behavior. Then when I realized that that approach was locking me to the implementation itself, I was doing unit tests where the unit was a unit of source code. And when I understand that the unit should be a unit of behavior, I then moved into an approach of the given one then. So option three. However, I have been finding that that given when and then sometimes don't give me the value that I was expecting. And nowadays I'm on the stage where I find more value on expressing myself with option four in the snake case variant. I find it easier to express the tests that way. Now I would like to know about you. Which convention do you use? Is one that is not listed on these four that I showed you? Please let me know on the comments. I would love to hear from you. And if you like this video, I have a lot of testing content for you on this playlist right here. I will see you soon. In the meanwhile, keep it simple.